uh, Sensing and Siren are very active in the law enforcement market. What kind of problems does that solve for your cop on the street, the investigator, the analyst? When somebody's looking at an investigation, it it synthesizes it into who's who and reveals some additional connections you've missed. Welcome to Siren Investigate, the podcast that investigates the cutting edge of technology around investigations. I'm John Randall, CEO of Siren, joined today by Jeff Jonas, founder, CEO, and chief scientist of Sensing. Um, Jeff, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us today on the podcast. It's good to see you again, sir. Yeah. No, uh, thank you. <laughs> and today we have Jeff as a guest because we have announced a strategic partnership this week between Sarn and Sensing, integrating the Sarn's uh, excellent uh, entity resolution technology into the Sarn Investigate uh, platform. Jeff, tell us a little bit about that, and tell us a little bit about why you think that's important for the law enforcement community. Well. First, where did we come from? I'll, I'll maybe hit that. That's a great point. We, I had a software company. We built custom software. And one of the systems we built was for Las Vegas. It became known as NORA, Non-Obvious Relationship Awareness. And the casinos wanted to take all this data from all these different sources, including all of this investigative data, and just make sure they really knew who they were doing business with. So we built that, and it started finding clever bad people people that are using 32 different names and six different social security numbers and they're trying to obfuscate who they were, trying to be undetected. And ultimately, this software caught the eye of NQTEL, the venture capital arm of the CIA. We took a funding from them in 2001 and then in 2003 with Reed Elsevier, the parent of LexisNexis. And in 2005, we sold my SRD company to IBM. Oh, so here's this team that has that built five generations of entity resolution sitting here with me there. And IBM asked me one day, what do you wish you could do if you could do anything around here? And I said, well, if you give me $50 million, <laughs> I can envision a sixth generation entity resolution engine that'll be a real-time AI, self-correcting, self-tuning, and explainable, so you can explain why you're making a big decision. And they yeah. said, get started. And so we built that and spun it out. So Sensing... My team on average has been with me building these things for 20 years. It's a sixth generation engine. We've shrunk it down so it fits inside of other people's things. Today, we're talking how exciting it is that it is our transmissions running in your car. Yeah. And what our tech does is it figures out when two people are the same or related, even though the data is messy, very messy, or even that people are creating professionally fabricated lies Fantastic. Now that's a uh, super context because it gives the background and the, the heritage, the lineage of uh, the technology. And can you talk a little bit, Jeff, about how that's particularly uh, applicable to law enforcement? You know, as uh, Sensing and Siren are very active in the law enforcement market, what kind of problems does that solve for your cop on the street, the investigator, the analyst who are trying to solve the problems that they're trying to solve uh, for their communities? Two ways, really. One is you're already investigating something. Somebody's up and missing. <laughs> There's you're arresting somebody, you're trying to figure out the entire chain of command about who's making this happen. So you're in an investigative process. When you're doing an investigative process, you're sitting there looking at, at quite a bit of data. That'd be data you've maybe historically collected. Maybe, maybe when you've done the arrest, you've found some additional information you want to add. Maybe there's some third party data that you maybe wanted to import about some of those parties to get a more complete view about maybe other addresses that the people under investigation have been at. And now you've got in your network, your picture, your graph, your whatever you want to call it, you've got all these, all these people and all these companies, but you got this name and that name and this name and one's Elizabeth and one's Beth and one's Lizzie the shape of that graph changes or that network changes when it's been entity resolved. And so one thing our technology does is it allows your product, when somebody's looking at an investigation, it, it synthesizes it into who's who and reveals some additional connections you've missed. So it changes the shape of that picture 
and makes it more crisp. And what does that do? Yeah. That speeds up the investigation and allows somebody to make a better decision faster. The second thing it does embedded in a tech like yours is it helps find interesting things. I would say better focus human attention. You might be investigating ABC, but it might say, hey, because of this and that, this is really maybe one of the most interesting things. Maybe you're maybe you're trying to find a missing person and the suggestion is this is maybe the most interesting person in this yeah. investigative data to call first. Fantastic, fantastic. And if, if we go a little bit deeper on that, Jeff, in terms of, you know, as you described, uh, you have a transmission, we, uh, we have the car, you know, uh, talk to me about working with SARN and working, uh, you know, to to give the, the total experience to the end user. You know, uh, how does entity resolution help in graphs and search in, you know, folding these two things in together to make it uh, ultimately a very compelling solution for the market? This is definitely a one plus one equals 99 kind of thing. <clears throat> Sensing as a tech has no user interface. There's no way to experience it. You, uh, uh, you pass it names and addresses and phones about our people and company data or vessels. And, and what you get back is who's who and who's related to who, but it's a machine message. And what your tech does, which is it's your, your tech makes our smart widget beautiful yeah. and useful. So, about, and then to the other point there is you're uh, about, let's use search. You're searching for Beth Reston and you type in a name and a phone number. But maybe in the data, it was Elizabeth and Reston had two N's. Did you find it? Maybe you didn't. But with Sensing, you found it. Yeah. And maybe the phone number had a, 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 a plus six, five for Singapore, or maybe it didn't. Yeah. Did you try it both ways? You don't have to. Was the month and day transposed in the date of birth? You don't have to worry about that. Is the address messy? Ah, we got you covered. So you can search for messy data that has natural variability. Dick, Dickie, Richie, Ricardo, or all the spellings of Mohammed. And the sensing engine sorts that out. And then it returns to the platform. So there, go to your screen, fill in the search. Yeah. Your engine, your, your system, user interface passes that message to us. We pass back, uh, here's 16 different ways that name is presented differently across 16 different cases you've seen over the past. And now you can get a single view. And so it is rendered back to that in, investigative person, the analyst, is the most crisp picture plus some things that might be of some surprise. Hence, why this technology was originally called NORA, Non-Obvious Relationship Awareness. It earned the name, really. And it started finding things. You'd be like, that's crazy. How did it find yeah. that? Yeah, that's super. And uh, from, from our perspective then, uh, you know, one of the most important things about sensing is the explainability. You know, you, you mentioned that in the introduction, it being explainable and justifiable. Talk to me a little bit more about that and how that's particularly important to law enforcement. I'm going to start with the, if you don't have, if you're making decisions about who's who and you're knocking doors down and, and, and talking to people that are in the wrong person, you better be able to explain why you did that. Yeah. There's a growing number of technologies out there that are not explainable. You can't say why, just like trust the model it was trained on. That's not, that's yeah, not, not it, it, it. law enforcement doesn't work that way. Does it? Yeah. And, and I do a lot of work in, in, in privacy and civil liberties and knocking on run on the wrong doors is just a great example of bad behavior. Yeah. <laughs> so you better be able to explain what you're doing. So we've put a lot of work into having our engine produce the same answer every time with the same data. It's right. not willy nilly changing its mind. You ask chat GPT something, ask it tomorrow. It's a different answer. It's a different answer. It's a different answer. It's creative. We're not yeah. creative. We will tell you it's the same every time, given yeah, the same can. data, but yeah. then you can say why. And it'll explain how it, how it got that way. First, I learned this, then I learned that, then I learned this. Because the names were like this and the addresses were like that, we, we decided these things were closer to the same, and therefore this is true. And I'm going to give you one 
Well, my favorite examples about this, this is an, is it, I'll call it an, an investigative type of project for one of our customers. And they had two records that were so different. They wouldn't tell me the names. Yeah. But let's say it was Sue and Jimmy K. And I went, they're the same people. And you're like, yeah. oh, Sue, Sue and Jimmy K? But there were 11 records in between that were the glue. And when so, they said, how is, how could it be Sue is Jimmy K? And they went, well, Sue's middle name over here is, well, it was Kristen with a K. Da, 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 da. And then the next record, the next record. And then because yeah. of this film and date of birth. And they went to a, a grease board with uh, these two data scientists and spent 45 minutes studying our report on how did this come to be. And they look at each yeah. other, holy heck, sensing's right. And it was yeah. right. Excellent. And that and that is a technique that's pretty unique to sensing. We invented my team and I uh, called it entity centric learning, where you're learning over time every name, every address, every phone they've used. We learned this back from Vegas, and when built into your platform, it means the investigate the quality of the investigations, the completeness of the view, is second to none. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, because. That reminds me of projects we've worked on in in sensing, and uh, you know, uh, when I see it in action together and collectively, you've got effectively you're building a single view of of a person across an organization, across many many databases. That you're never going to have the budget or time to remap all of these things physically to say this is John Randall's is the same as that John Randall, same as that John Randall. So, so you're almost building a virtual person that, again, that's why it complements our platform so much that you have a search that's consistent, the graph that's consistent, you know, with the embedded AI that's learning what makes these people connected. When, the, again, there's the not an obvious relation, but, uh, you know, talk a little bit, Jeff, around uh, how you can remove false positives. You can remove the analysts going down the wrong track by having better entity resolution. Yeah, we do a few things in this in this regard. One of our privacy features is we favor the false negative. We only tell you they're the same if there's overwhelming evidence. We have a second category that says they're probably the same, but wait a minute, you should double check. You should, you should have some additional information to be sure. And our third category is they're related. They're not the same people, but they're related. This, these three people all use the same email address yeah. or they're all roommates. And so that would be a relationship. So it's same, possibly the same and related. Uh, another thing that we do is we take the future information that arrives and use it. If we've learned something, it turns out this is hard and expensive. Of the 50 million yeah. we've spent doing this, this is non-trivial. Imagine whether you're in 10,000 records 10 million or 10 billion, no matter how many entities you've seen, when you get the next record and you figure out where it fits, where that puzzle piece fits, you have to ask yourself, now that I know that, had I known that before, yeah. have I made any decisions that I would change my mind about? This is really important because every now and then you might conflate two records and put them together. That's a false positive. Yeah. An example of this is junior and a senior. You get the same name, the same address, the same phone. That is really very likely the same person. Sure. However, every now and then that was a junior and a senior. Maybe you learned one of the dates of birth late. And it's the moment you learn that you should be able to take those apart. And sensing does that in real time. That means your platform does that in real time. Huh. Yeah. No, that's super. That's super because, you know, uh, you, you learn over time then new information comes in the system is able to uh, reapply that and give new knowledge to the front line who is just is just looking for the right answer quickly so you know i i can really see how that's of huge benefit um just to talk a little bit about 
you know, the application of this technology in real world scenarios. Uh, say, for example, when we talk to our customers now, supply chain crime is a huge topic, you know, uh, the, and everything that that entails, knowing who is who in the supply chain, people trying to infiltrate them, et cetera. Talk to me about sending experience with that and how that helps. You can help tighten and secure supply chains and uh, the kind of cri criminality that's happening there. I would say roughly 30% of the people using the sensing entity resolution AI are building into the systems that are serving supply chain visibility, integrity of supply chain. They're taking vendor and organization data that's their own. Yeah. On top of that, they're layering third party who owns who owns who owns who back to ultimate beneficial owners corporate hierarchy chains, officers, directors, they're using data sets like, say, Ari, Dunham, Bradstreet, Bureau Van Dyke, and these other data sets. And they're ingesting that. And it builds out that network and chain. And we're, we're, it allows you, and then on top of that, they're adding sanctions data, sure. like from opensanctions.org or, or uh, a I'll call it bespoke, bad guy only data sets where they found bad guys, uh, interesting parties and all the people underneath them from data sets like Caron. But this is about loading third party data about organizations and organizational hierarchies and risk. And when you bring entity resolution to that and detect relationships, for example, around addresses, you get this really complete view and yeah. it helps you find risk faster. And of course, the way to see that and the way to find that risk is in using a car with a dashboard <laughs> siren. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> uh, sensing is just a, a piece of the brain. And 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 Jeff, just to go a little deeper on that in terms of uh, the the supply chains, is this in counterfeit goods, cyber attacks, fraud? Talk about uh, some of the uh, of the use cases because you know there's such rich you know corporate hierarchy information out there, sanctions uh, data out there, but pulling that all together is hard and expensive, isn't it? It it can be. In fact, for yeah. for many entity resolution people, uh, uh, the average person doesn't realize how hard it is, how much money it costs to build really good entity resolution, and how hard it can be. Many entity resolution technologies, it is so hard to get the data prepared and to train it and tune it to match. But we've yeah. built this engine that does that out of the box, which serves your customers incredibly well. The speed with which they can bring a new data set like sanctioned data and overlay it to see if there's any entities in that data set who are should warrant extra care, maybe to protect their brand or maybe for compliance. I've seen this used in uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, where you're trying to make sure there's people in your network who are selling your products yeah. far away through an ecosystem. We license it to them. They resell it to them. They resell it to them. But you want to make sure there's no politically exposed persons. There's no secondary deals out there that are going to really foul you up under that law. Yeah. Um, uh, counterfeiting and diversion, diversion where you're sending product to one place at, at one price point, but then they sneak it out of there, take it to an, a geo where the price point is different, sell it for more. Yeah. Um, if, when you find corruption in a supply chain, we've, uh, we've seen this where you shut down a Chinese manufacturer for child labor practices. Yeah. They turn up the next day. It's just got a different company name. The address is on the other side of the street, not over here. You're yeah. doing business with exactly the same company that you just got rid of because they tinkered with a few things in their, yeah. in their identity. Hmm. Yeah, and these are uh, super important business issues uh, at the board level in, in these customers that we're dealing with, aren't they? Because, you know, nobody wants to be running a file of sanctions, running a file of child labor laws or being involved with any people in their supply chain that could be so, so damaging to their brand reputation or, or business. These are huge issues, aren't they, Jeff? It is a huge issue. Brand, brand integrity, brand reputation, reputational risk. 
that's it. That's an expensive problem. Yeah, no, it, it really is. I, and moving then from, say, more the commercial world to the the policing world. Look, in the US, fentanyl has been a huge, huge story, a huge issue, so many uh, problems for law enforcement, huge problem for society, so many overdoses and deaths. It's also a huge problem. We see it now in, in New Zealand, Australia. It's becoming a huge problem in Europe. Uh, talk to me about how entity resolution at the highest level can help address some of the the supply chain issues, but also just the the raw policing investigation part of the problem around fentanyl. Well, there there you are. You've made your arrest, and it's a fentanyl related case. What you're going to do is take whatever data you found around that person. You'd be like, who are you, the who are the people you were talking to the most? Yeah. And you're going to take that data and you're going to layer it in. And that's a first layer layer of entities. What you might then want to do is compare that to all of your other fentanyl cases to figure out if there's any nexus between them. If it turns out you've run three fentanyl cases and across the information that those, each of those, what looked like discrete networks, yeah. if there's two people that they've all been talking to, of course, the, the data is messier than that. You may have missed it unless you stared at it for 300 years. Yeah. But sensing is going to help weave that together. So you're going to take that base data. You're going to find connections in it. You're going to add some third-party data maybe as you get more investigative in these parties of interest. That might be the glue that finds you some additional data. And what this is going to do is help focus your investigation, speed up your investigation, be more confident about where you're spending your time. Yeah, no, that's a great point. We've been involved in a number of those cases, particularly where – you know, um, people have overdosed and they found the phone on the scene. It's a, it's the phone data that they collect over time is incredibly important. And this, you know, when you take that forensic data, it could be contact history, it could be, you know, email activity. It can be things like, uh, you know, common uh, activities uh, on Twitter. And like you said, just putting that all together and building a network of the the entire supply chain or a, a clue to start looking in a particular direction. You know, uh, is uh, is digital forensics a kind of a, a jumping in point to sensing as well as the other ones we talked about? To the extent it's about an entity, digital forensics, yeah. as long as it's about a who or a company, you know, a person, a company, a vessel, sensing takes the attributes about them and takes all that messy data and allows you to synthesize it and reduce it into the unique who is who and who's related to who. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fantastic because uh, we've we've done that uh, to the extent that we're, you know, we're, we're gluing the various other aspects together where, you know, we're taking the dig digital forensics, we're taking social media activity, we're taking internal RMS, CAD and various other historical data and using sensing as an entity resolution across those things and, and able to present that as an investigation network within the, the, the graph, as you like to call it, Jeff. You know, there's a lot of graphing technologies out there, but it's it's building that holistic graph that we think, you know, the, the, the fentanyl problem is one of such scale. It needs more and more automation. It needs more and more smarts to actually get to these people who are who are just operating at such scale you know they're driving the workload of law enforcement across the US uh, and it needs to be combated with large scale automation in, in in return I don't know if you if you see that in the industry as well I I just want to make one other comment is that when about to where we just were though I was when you take three fentanyl cases and you combine it into one view yeah this I'm a, what i'm about to describe creates gasps in the room your users will not be able to unsee about what i'm about to say when i say this and then they try it you can't unsee it sure imagine the data you've collected from three fentanyl investigations is going to look one way but if i showed you as they will see in your platform the difference between that and that data entity resolved yeah the way it crystallizes that it's not 217 things, it's 17 things. Yeah. The way that graph changes its shape, that network changes its shape, 
the, the confidence, the certainty, the speed of being able to figure out what's going on and miss and find things you would have missed. You can't unsee it. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Okay, what was the next thing you want to talk about? I just wanted to get that in there. You no, you're right. you're you're absolutely right because with these large problems that come along, ten years ago people weren't talking about fentanyl. Five years ago they weren't talking about it. Now it is the number one law enforcement issue. We, uh, yeah, our customers talk about uh, I, I'm one solve for, and uh, one of the things we see as well to share this insight is, you know, the lead time of training an analyst is with historical technology is so long. You know, we, in our research. It takes between six and 18 months to, tra to train an analyst, right? Uh, and if it takes that long to train somebody up, how long does it take them to be effective on fentanyl investigations? So can you take the traditional approach and try and address this problem that's operating at such scale uh, across the country when it takes six to 18 months to train an analyst? You know, I, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed by automation and a better technology stack than we've been using in the past. You know, so the, that's our philosophy and that's where the partnership we've announced with yourselves is so important with that is just giving better insight quickly, you know, dramatically quicker than traditional, more manual methods that people have been using in the world. It's really about AI helps humans get more work done more effectively. Yeah. It's really, especially in this, in, in the case of investigative work where you're dealing with making sure you're fingering the right people, it's this combination of a human plus. It's not yeah. machines that are gonna just go off and do this. Uh, they're going to help a human find more interesting things, have a more narrow focus and go just after the people that really need to be going after and not, not all the all the majority of the innocent folks. So it's really yeah, a beautiful. No, that's a great area. point. Yeah. So so really, there's a direct translation from what we're talking about is how much crime you solve with how much resource you put into it, with how much work you can do by the analyst that you're you, you you're trying to save them time so they can get through a higher workload to uh, address the scale of the problem that's out there today. And, and, and that has everything to do with reducing the false positives. Yeah. And when you reduce the false negatives, it allows you to, it makes it easier to find the most interesting thing to work on. Maybe on any given day, there's a lot of cases you could be working on, but but yeah. maybe today, the, the case where you have the most evidence and it's the biggest deal and it's the most important thing, it's maybe those false negatives that you weren't finding that helps you move a case that didn't have enough strings to pull. Sometimes in missing person cases, you're you're trying to figure out who to call next to locate this kid. Yeah. And maybe today, a new piece of data has just arrived. Maybe it was some data that showed up in the fentanyl case. Sure. A new piece of data just arrived. And, and now there's a new person that you can reach out to that maybe will help you locate that kid. If you don't have systems that help bring these things forward, you have to wait for humans to ask every question every day. Yeah. They'll have the yellow sticky on their screen and every... Three months, they'll check to see if they have any new information about how to find their the kid. Fantastic. And Jeff, uh, when you think about those kind of investigations we're dealing with, the problems you're solving for, uh, you know, for, for somebody who's working as long as you have in this industry, you must find it incredibly satisfying to be, you know, uh, uh, working with the good guys on the on these problems. The team and I get a lot of joy out of helping this field. I'd call it bad guy hunting. It's it's great to have tech that contributes to finding a few bad guys. We get used in marketing as well. And another use case, uh, I'll just put it out there because it's law enforcement related. We got used in the, in the state of Utah to help the clean slate law remove felony records from people who uh, had minor felonies. So now they get active. half a million people had their felonies uh, removed. Fantastic. And uh, now they get access to voting and better jobs. So the tech's very universal about understanding who's who. But yeah. obviously in investigative data and fentanyl, finding missing kids, bringing down really uh, violent gangs, 
these are all really important and and they're clever these people are clever Cle yeah. clever bad people don't use the same name and address on every record they just yeah. don't and we have worked on this very hard to help products like yours be able to see through that uh, obfuscation and that's essential to make policing effective or more effective yeah yeah one other area to touch on is uh, cross jurisdiction data sharing across borders obviously this was a huge issue back in 911 when you know in the US there so many fusion centers set up you know data sharing was seen as a big Achilles heel in the system back then what do you think in terms of an industry how far we've come on data sharing uh, uh, cross border, cross jurisdiction. So again, when you, when you talk to the bad guys, are exploiting our inability to make sure it's the same person. Obviously, that must have a knock on effect in cross jurisdiction. Uh, how do you how do you see as an industry we're getting better or not on data sharing cross jurisdiction? First, to highlight the problem is like if I've got all the blue piece puzzle pieces and you have the yellow puzzle pieces and that jurisdiction just over there, it's a it's you know three counties all are are, are sitting there and have a, a nexus together and one one corner is shared, or people are moving between three say counties. But if each of us have our own pile of puzzle pieces, you can't get the whole picture. But the, the first question is: Is it legal? And you and you what you don't do is you don't use technology. You go well, that's that's not legal, but with some tech we can get under it. That's not how it's really done. Yeah. Well, you first have to find you first find where where it's legal to share. The biggest problem with sharing is everybody wants to be the recipient, so it's legal. But then, and everybody wants to be yeah. wants to share, but they're like, "I'd love to share information. Just send me yours." So you get each of the three jurisdictions going. Hey, go ahead, yeah, share, yeah, share it. Right. So I've sat on a number of commissions over the years working on this. We've built things into our entity resolution AI to do this. To allow people that they'd like to share, but they would like to just find the nexus. Yeah. I don't want you to have all my data forever, but if any of your data matches any of my data, that narrows it down. This is about narrowing and investigative focus. Imagine three jurisdictions and imagine being able to entity resolve across those and find just the things that match. Yeah. And move those to the surface. Yeah, fantastic. That's powerful. It's really powerful. Super. It's about narrowing. It's about minimizing the amount of information flow. Information is just trying to escape anyway. The more piles of information, the more risk that information is going to get out of there. Yeah. So when you combine data uh, in entity resolution, you're creating a single index, then you only expose to the parties the things that they need to see, and, 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 and you're reducing all kinds of unintended disclosure and uh, other kinds of bad things, bad outcomes of data getting out too yeah. far. Yeah. What about the future of investigative technology? What do you see out there? Where is it going? What excites Love, you? Gloves. Gloves. <laughs> <laughs> my, my joke about Tom Cruise and Minority Report is the fact he had to swipe and look. Yeah, yeah. That's just so old school. Yeah. You, you see, when you go that movie real... was, that was 24 years ago. I just found that out the other day, 24 <laughs> years that... ago. Oh, man. Yeah. Come on, me. Well, I was only 50 years old then. I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not by much. Okay. Um, the future, I think, is really going to be is about being able to make better sense of what you know. Yeah. You, your organization has all this entitlement rights to A, B, C, D. And what is your ability to make sense of what you know? Yeah. And when your organization knows that, then who in your organization should be tasked with that? It's directing it to the right person. And it it's the the combination of I'll call sensing uh, a fusion engine. It fuses data to get the 360 degree view of the parties. That then is a I'll call it a food or a fuel that services analytics that triages it, red light, yellow light, green light. Yeah. Helps order it. And then investigatively, it helps you get the clearest view. And it, it just makes a big difference in people doing this kind of work. Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, our our perspective on that is very aligned. I think that's what's exciting about this partnership is, 
you know, when we can help that user experience, help to get to zero training model of onboarding an analyst where it, the, the system is as intuitive as using the internet or using all the apps on your phone, you know, and, and then where, you know, the combination of Siren technology and sensing serves up really, you know, smart, well thought out leads, then they're working on the right thing. So, you know, the more automation we can bring to bear, the, you know, we start really getting at the challenges of recruitment, retention, productivity that we can uh, uh, address the challenges that these people are being asked to solve, which uh, uh, oftentimes are not on the increasing budgets of the adversary. You know, the, 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 you know, when people are making money on the fraud side, the narcotics, the people trafficking, they, they've almost a limited budget, <laughs> right? Because they keep growing their revenue. Whereas we, we keep holding um, law enforcement budgets flat uh, and decreasing them. So, so they need the help of automation. You know, that's uh, one of the things I think there's a great compliment. Yeah. Uh, complementary fit between sensing and siren where we can, can fit together and solve these problems together. Yeah. It's like, uh, here, use this power tool. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's got AI with traceability, accountability, explainability, so you can make better decisions faster. You can believe in, yeah, here's a power tool <laughs> and it runs on one ten. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Exactly. <laughs> that's important. So look, in, in closing uh, remarks, you know, we're really excited about the partnership with Sensing. The topics we've talked about today are hugely important for our industry. The ability for us to integrate together or have a solution out of the box where, you know, we're, we're resolving the entities, we're providing the full search experience, the graph, the, the reporting, uh, the audit, everything that goes with that. We're really excited about the possibilities that provides for the industry. Jeff, any closing thoughts or remarks yourself? We're, we're equally excited about this. When you have a, a product like ours that has no face, it's just smart about one thing, seeing it inside your product and its richness and the user experience that people get and the outcomes that it helps produce, it really goes back to that one plus one is 99. It's, it's exciting. I mean, I'm excited, I'm excited to hear, hear the feedback about your users uh, when we show up and visit at your conferences because collectively, this is just really good stuff. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic.